Welcome to the Create Something Awesome Today podcast, where it's all about educating and motivating creative pros and entrepreneurs from around the world with simple and easy to implement ideas. And of course, helping you create something awesome today. And now, welcome your host. He is the founder of Founder of Awesome Creator Academy, a YouTube educator, and the biggest Star Wars nerd you'll ever meet, Roberto Blake. Hey, everybody, and welcome back to the Create Something Awesome Today podcast. This is your host, Roberta Blake, helping you create something awesome today. Welcome back to the channel. We've got a great show for you today. We're going to be talking about the secrets of actually becoming an influencer, popular topic right now. We've been covering that a lot on the channel with some of our sponsors, and we've actually talked about it quite a bit before here on the podcast, but I want to bring in a special guest in order to help me with tonight's topic. So let's go ahead and welcome him. And now, this week's special guest, bursting with ideas and ready to share them with you. Yo, 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 what's up? Justin Moore in the house. Stoked to be here. Thanks, Roberto. Yeah, no, thank you so much, Justin. So for like the uh, five people in my audience who have no idea who you are, why don't you tell us a little (laughs) bit about yourself? Give them the 30-second version or the 60-second version elevator pitch of who Justin Moore is. Let's go. Uh, I am uh, the founder of Creator Wizard. I'm a sponsorship coach. I help you find and negotiate your dream sponsorship so that you stop leaving thousands on the table. I've been creator, a big creator along with my wife for over 10 years. Uh, started the first YouTube channel in 2009. We have made over $3 million on brand deals and sponsorships over the years. Wow. Uh, and so this is my area of expertise. I've run an influencer marketing agency for about six years. So I have both sides of it as a creator, as well as running an agency. And I'm stoked to dig into it today. That's the ver- That's a big difference in perspective. And I'm glad you brought that up. Huge different perspective. Tell me a little bit about how you and your wife got started in YouTube, what your journey looked like, what videos you guys made, how you guys discovered YouTube in the first place. Yeah, so it was definitely my wife, not me. I was in, <clears throat> I'm an engineer by my background, um, and uh, I was in medical devices <laughs> at the time. And so this reminds just, me of my friend Benji Travis. His wife was the YouTuber. Yeah. He was the real estate guy backing her up behind the scenes. Exactly. I just would chatted with Benji, caught up a couple of days ago. Like, you know, him and I, th- we have very similar stories to them. Like, um, you know, my wife, April, started her first YouTube channel in 2009. Uh, and this was back before the partner program. Couldn't make money on YouTube. Very. Much I was around hobby. back then. Yeah. It's like, the, uh, I feel like a, we would call OG YouTubers, right? It's we like, are. We you are. know, it was like, we got into it. it it's very That's different. That's early from YouTube. Those... That's like the first yeah. three years. That's before it everything. Is. Yeah. yeah. And like, you know, honestly, people coming into it now, it's like you can come into it and be like, oh, I'm going to make money on this someday. But in the beginning, like none of us, it was the Wild West. None nothing. of us was like, oh, we could make. Yeah, we could make. The, the website was clunky as hell. Do you remember yeah, that? Super there, was no, there wasn't even five star ratings back then. I'm sorry. There wasn't no. thumbs up, thumbs down. Everyone's complaining about the thumbs down <laughs> counter going away. We had five star ratings. Yeah, seriously, it was like, I remember uh, first YouTube video was like the letterbox on the side. Yes. You know, it was, just, it was like very early days. And remember so, we could use you, HTML code like MySpace? Yeah, seriously, it was it was like completely different experience. <laughs> they like you do. I don't think people remember what it was like. I remember like e bombs world, like way back in the day. You know, like what we were what we were getting excited about, like actually watching video on the internet, right? So it was just like you know early days. So her first YouTube channel was about uh, beauty, cosmetics, skincare products. So for her, like getting free products in the beginning yeah. was like mind blowing. Like really, you're gonna send me free products? And so like that was the the big exciting thing, you know, in 2009, 2010. Free um, stuff. Free uh, like, stuff, right? Yeah. And in the early days, like I think, like the major inflection point, I think for us, both of us, was like this: the first brand approached with a like actually offering to compensate us. Like that was like, what are you talking about? How, like, how are we going to do that? And so my wife was like, well, they sent this contract, and I here I am in business school, like I can help with this, right? And right. so I'm like reading the contract. I, I remember vividly like asking our family lawyer to like look at the contract, and she was like, what is this? Like, what are you doing? You're making money on the internet? Like, what? Is, right? And so bless her heart, like, you know, and so that was like the very early days. None of us had any idea what we were doing, um, you know, got made all sorts of mistakes, you know, agreeing to like do tons of posts for like peanuts. Um, and so it's just like, that is the perspective that we came at this from is like making every mistake in the book pretty much. Um, and, and so, yeah, it transitioned from like me being behind the camera, you know, to us, me being in front of the camera, starting a family vlog channel, cooking channel. Uh, you know, we've got about 1.5 million followers across all of our platforms now. And so it's just like, nice. this is very, this has very much been the family business, but I, you know, I quit my full-time job six weeks when, after my first son. Six months born. after 
No, it was so, um, uh, after your first child was born. So how many my years first child in? Was born. How many years in before you quit your job to become full time? And at what point did she become full time? So she became full time two years prior to, than I did because I still kind of like had the full time job. You know, so how long after two thousand nine was yeah, that? Yeah. So she so she quit. I believe she quit in two thousand. 2015 because our son was born in 2017 so six so, years six or 2014 years. sorry sorry 2012 2012. 2012 2012 is when she quit so three years after so and three then years I, after okay yeah and then i quit and in then, 2014 and then you quit in 2014 2015 mm -hmm. so like that actually sounds a lot like a typical side hustle to business transition of mm -hmm. you need three years to five years to build something that's profitable sustainable can provide a decent lifestyle still maintain margins still cover expenses and is reliable enough to actually not feel like it's a massive risk and anxiety attack. Do you mind telling uh, us how much y'all were making per year at that time from YouTube yeah, so, and influencer and so on? Yeah, I remember. So like, I remember us, the the number of $10,000 a month, that was like for us, the number that we had like picked as like, yeah. once we were making that in incremental income, above my nine to five salary. Cause like, you know, when I quit that money was going to go away. Like my full yeah, exactly. Income, you're going to go and down so, in income streams. You're going to lose a little yeah. income stream. Yeah. You're going to lose an income obsessed stream. With. The, thing yeah, exactly. the multiple income streams get a new mm -hmm. one every year. Yeah. And, and so that was our logic was like, okay, once we hit that, like I have to quit because because I looked at it as an opportunity cost. What could we make if I focus six, four, 60 hours a week on, you know, just our creator business? Effort um, to so, dollar ratio that I call that effort to dollar effort ratio. To do yeah, exactly. And so like that was once we hit that, it was shortly after because I remember when I quit, everyone thought I was nuts. You have a newborn baby. Like, how could you do this? And I kept telling people, look, like we have been planning for this for two years that once I would hit this threshold, we would we would make this change. Well, you had a newborn baby yeah, and you were exactly. making six figures and you yeah. had the option to choose your time, mm -hmm. your value, your lifestyle with nobody dictating the, how you are part of your family. So they asked, mm -hmm. how could you do this? How could you not? Right, right. Uh, the, the thing I've always talked about, you know, this idea of quitting your full-time job, uh, I think it's a really important one, which is that I everyone said that, like, you know, this is so risky. How could you do this? And in my, like, opinion, if there's any sort of economic instability, your company won't think twice to fire you immediately, right? We and saw so, that in the last two years. Yes, exactly. You saw that in the last two years. And so when you're a creator, <clears throat> the likelihood of your income going to zero is very unlikely. Like if you're a YouTuber, like, yeah, maybe if your viewership starts declining, it's not going to be, unless you get demonetized, it's going to be a slow and steady decline, declines where you have some time to start trying to diversify your revenue streams. Well, no one's views go to zero out of Exactly. Nowhere. No one, exactly. And so it's much... I believe you can build up a robust income stream as a creator. It's a much less risky career than having a nine to five job. And it also diversifies your income sources in a way that a nine to five job doesn't. And it actually makes it non-linear to your time and effort and your physical energy, your human capital. So it decouples. What I tell people is that being a content creator, once you pass a certain amount of years and you've built it up and you've, if you've monetized it properly, which as you know, is what I'm really trying to teach. If I have a vertical within the creator economy, your vertical is largely specializing in brand deals, super narrow niche down, which I love because you're the encyclopedia of brand. Actually, that's how I kind of refer to it, is the encyclopedia of brand deals. You know, what I do or what I like to do is I, I focus kind of on six ways that creators and influencers make money. And I try to teach people those six ways and that's the money part of like what I talk about, aside from also the business structure, those things, business 101 for creators, is I try to teach them, here are your monetization streams. I try to teach them also marketing language and jargon from the world we came from. I came from advertising and marketing. I worked at an ad agency for over a year in New York, uh, mostly in sports entertainment cable stuff. So print out of home, some digital and all the OH stuff. Mm -hmm. But also I did the marketing at a host, a web hosting company which means wow. that I have the creative technology and marketing and advertising background and the money conversations because when I worked at the web hosting company, all of our customers were basically online business owners because why else would you have web hosting for the most part? Like they right. were, it's e So early days, e-commerce, early days, web hosting, all that stuff. Like, because um, again, um, before the 2010s even, you know, so um, I was in the industry back then. I was like, you know, in like 2000, like 
six, seven, something like that. So like right, the um, for throughout a couple of years afterward and everything like that, leaving the industry around like 20, like 12 or whatever. Right. So I've been solo doing this stuff for like a, almost a decade now. And but I came from the traditional version of it. I came mm-hmm. from the traditional version of it. Web and graphic design. So I understand the branding that comes into being an influencer before you could ever be an influencer. I had a blog. I had a blog back in 2006, 2007 as a creative and freelancer um, that I'd started like, I think during college. And I'd been building websites since like 1999 because I taught myself HTML at 13. I taught myself video editing before YouTube ever came out. And I was making like anime music videos and <laughs> like movie trailers before YouTube ever existed back in the days of Bear, Share, Napster, LimeWire. And I would bring all this up because I'm trying to illustrate the importance of the skill sets that give someone an advantage in the influencer world and how priming themselves for opportunity matters because your mm. background made you a prime candidate for this being not risky. And it meant that when the opportunity of new platforms, new income sources, new uh, ventures, when the creator economy matured, you were prepared for the opportunity that presented itself now. And you had to learn from nothing just like I did. Yeah. Today, yeah. people have us. They didn't have to get these lessons firsthand. They're getting them secondhand from us. Right. We paid the dues. I'm not trying to brag when I say we paved the way, but I'm saying we had to go from a traditional world that was much more rigid and harder into a virgining digital world and be the uh, path you know, uh, makers, the map makers and get the arrows in our back and make the mistakes. Now the frameworks that we present, which some people still have skepticism around are all those lessons. And it's like, there are less traps and arrows and less uh, wilderness to be explored. We've made those maps and yeah, right. we're selling you the maps and we're selling <laughs> you the shovel, the Eldorado, but we have the right to do that because we took the arrows and we bit and we made the damn maps and we cut down the jungle. Like we did it. Like right. we were there. Right. We were there uh, in the early days. Like we've been mm-hmm. at it for a long time, 10 years, like I said, and it didn't come right. from nothing. We had to have the skills to survive that wilderness. Well, I think that like one of the most important like, like insights from that story is that, you know, sometimes it takes grinding something out and having the foresight and the vision to be like, no, you know what? I think this thing is going to be something in two years or three years. Everyone wants to come into it and make money immediately, you know, blow not up in two months. put in the work. Yeah, blow up in two months and like reap the rewards. Like a great example of this is that um, my wife and I started doing live commerce about 18 months ago. So Amazon Live, like, you know, there's, there's, there's a lot of investment. Things. Yeah, there's been a lot of investment being poured into this space right now. Um, you know, pretty much all the major social platforms are investing in this Instagram shop, you know, live shopping. Live stream like, and live commerce experiences yes. are the future of consumerism. The yeah. pandemic paved the way on the timing on that. The, the technology 100%. was developed before, but the pandemic made it reality and my and gave it its moment. Yeah. And it, honestly, like in the early days, like for us, you know, we at, by that time when we started doing this, like, you know, 18 months ago, we had been creators for a decade, but it was like, we saw, we were like, this is the future. We are going to invest in this. We're going to upgrade our equipment. We're going to like understand how to, you know, be dynamic in a live environment, interact with the live audience. Cause we've live streamed, but it's different to like yes. talk about products and like, it's just a very different thing. And so like fast forward to today and we have made hundreds of thousands of dollars in 18 months doing live streaming on Amazon live. And so it's like, like from sponsorships and, you know, commissions and all this, there's just like, like for us, like this is a completely new revenue stream that didn't exist in our business 18 months ago. Right. And so it was like, but we had the foresight because we relied on our experience as creators and said like, Hey, like this is something we should invest in. Even though we're really busy right now, this, this could carry the next 10 years of our life as creators. Yeah. So it's like, it's those inflection points and those moments that you have to look at and like, maybe I'm going to invest a bunch of time for the next 12 months. I'm not going to see much return, but I the have time the will pass. this. Well, yeah, the time will pass anyway. Yeah. Here's the thing I look at like this. You will win or you will learn. Mm, What's the downside to having the skill set of being a live streamer, even if you don't make money or you get out of it immediately? What's the downside to learning everything about live streaming, learning everything about live um, audio, learning everything about video codecs, learning everything um, about interacting with a live audience, becoming a better orator, public speaker, becoming a better interviewer and learning to ask questions, learning to actively listen, which you can see I'm getting better at is to work on it. It's learning how to make jokes in real time, learning how to operate a soundboard. What mm-hmm. is the downside to walking away with that knowledge, even if you don't make a dollar up front, 
because if nothing else, you could sell that information, that expertise, or it can give you another opportunity, qualifies you for other jobs. What is the 100%. downside to the knowledge? And what is the downside to a body of work that demonstrates the ability to execute? It's actually like a great segue into this conversation about sponsorships because like, take that example. Um, like for example, as there's all these brands getting excited and reading all these industry articles about live commerce and stuff, they're, they're all of a sudden they go, they call up their agency and they're like, oh crap, what's our live commerce strategy, right? And so the agency's like, okay, well, let's go hire some creators. Like, let's go, you know, try this out. And so if you as a creator have built up, you know, this body of expertise over the last 12 months um, to get really good at this thing, who's to say that you can't be a host for this brand. It doesn't have to just be on your platform. You could say, hey, like, I, I know you're trying to figure this out. What if I, the pitch to them is, what if I become your live commerce host for your Amazon storefront or for, you know, your, uh, on your YouTube channel for a lot, you know, YouTube shopping or exactly. whatever. Like, you I get can to do pitch this. yourself as a host and yes. then you get to charge yes. specifically a fee around that. And the thing is it's exactly. on their platform. And when that happens, your viewers numbers, and your uh, follower counts and your stats and your data don't matter. Because the exactly. thing is, they would need a face and they would need an actor or they would need an actress or they need a brand ambassador no matter what it is. If they can have a subject matter expert, they win. If they can have someone who already does have a following, the value of that is not them, oh, you bring your following with you. It's that you're not a rookie. You're not green. You know how this works. You respect and treat our brand like it's your own. You know how to not to make the faux pas. That is the value, people don't understand their value as a brand ambassador, because when I tell people to charge you, let's talk about this conversation. When I tell people to charge, I tell them, let's imagine for a minute, you don't even have a platform anymore, but you have the look or the lifestyle, or you represent and embody what the brand is or what the customer is, and you live the lifestyle and you know the thing better than anybody. So now you're the model and you're the actor and the actress and you can't charge off of your views and subscriber counts anymore. Now, how are you going to charge? I exactly. tell them, I don't tell them what to charge, but I tell them, start thinking and understand that your performance and your delivery and that, that has a value. Your, mm -hmm. So your representational value as an ambassador and spokesperson, imagine only being paid because you're a spokesperson, like back in the nineties before follower mm -hmm. counts existed. You're a spokesperson, you're a model right. that commands a price. You also have respect your reputation, that commands a price. But, oh, you're the creative director for the content. You're writing the script. You're doing editorial. You realize if you were working for the company, they have to pay you a salary. That has a price. Or right. if you were working for an ad agency, you realize that has a price. The other thing, too, is that, like, I think a lot of crews don't realize is that because you have an organic distribution channel, that is massively valuable. When a brand goes out, like you said, and hires actors, actresses, a full production crew to actually shoot it. Once they create the asset, they still have to pay YouTube, Facebook, and Instagram to serve for the distribution. App. Yeah, for distribution, right? So it's just like on top of everything that you do yeah. for them, they can run this ad. And so, yeah, and you know, one other quick point to that, um, which is really critical, is that not only you know are you kind of the face and the star of that content, but um, you have tremendous expertise that you've built up that brands will charge you just to help them be less stupid, right? Yeah. So you, they'll like hire you as a consultant and be like, Hey, I, you I, may I, not, I, you I, may I, not think, I, yeah, you may not think that 10,000 subscribers is a lot on your channel, but like to a brand, they're just like, wow, 10,000 subscribers. There are brands, there are yeah. brands <laughs> that rake in millions of dollars a year that have budgets for consultants that pay people less educated than you. If you have... There are brands that have less than 10,000 followers and subscribers in their platform. There are brands that have a million subscribers on YouTube and can't even break 2,000 views per upload. And it's kind of, I see it all the time. I won't name any names, mm -hmm. but you can find brands that have one to 2 million subscribers and cannot break a thousand subscribe a thousand to 2,000 views per upload. And guess what? You might be valuable to them because you're doing better than that with less subscribers. Like you might be, you might know something. You might be able to have more organic distribution and authority over their product or hardware or software than they do. And people do not think about this. And part of it, I think, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, Justin, is some of it also just living in this comparison, this influencer world where all they do is if I don't have a million views or a million subs, I'm nothing. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that's a big part of it. I have a, a rather hyperbolic video on my YouTube channel called 
how to get sponsorships with zero subscribers. And it talks about a lot of this stuff because it's like, oh, I love everyone, that is so, title. <laughs> every, <laughs> everyone is so fixated on this idea of, you know, viewership or followers. And like, I'm not, you know, I can't, the, the most toxic thing is like when a brand one time told them like, oh, we only work with creators who have 10,000 subscribers or whatever. And then that's stuck in your head for some reason as like this arbitrary threshold that you think you need to hit to start working with brands. And I tell people like, you literally, there's no number. Like they all, everyone always wants to know what's the number that I know. Like today, today is the number, whatever subscriber number you have, that's the amount, right? You, you, all you have to do is go out and craft a very compelling pitch and proposal to a brand of how you were going to help them accomplish how you're going to create business value. objective. Yeah. Well, no it, one knows like, how, no one knows that. Cause remember you saw this tweet. I put out a tweet where I said, all right, so how do you create a hundred thousand dollars worth of value for a brand? And no, almost nobody had an answer. They all wanted to know, well, what are you going to say, Roberto? <laughs> like, well, I'm like, I could tell you all my master plan, but I might decide to put that behind the membership like or something. <laughs> but but um, as far as 100, because I, I could tell you all uh, like a plan to get $10,000 on a brand deal. But like $100,000, I think I should like, I think you should pay money to hear what I have to say about how to get a $100,000 brand deal. Um, like, and I'm talking from a single brand relationship, but I'll tell you the, the teaser on that. And you tell me what you think. The teaser on that for me is I think that what you pitch a brand on is it's $100,000 or $120,000 for the year. So either way, like, or it could even be more, honestly, but my, my answer to it is if you want somewhere between $8,500 a month from a brand in a 12-month relationship, which is what would get you to about $105,000, so $100,000. In my mind, the only question, if you feel that you have the confidence to create value for the brand, you have the authority and the subject matter expertise, the answer is how many deliverables is that? And the thing is, you could let the brand move the goalpost on how many deliverables is worth $100,000 to them. But what I would look is the line item of the contracts of for these 12 months, part of what makes me worth a hundred thousand dollars or hundred and twenty thousand dollars, ten thousand dollars a month, eight thousand five hundred or ten thousand dollars a month, what makes me valuable to that is for that amount of money, I will keep your five biggest competitors' name out of my mouth and out of all my social media platforms for 12 months. Mm -hmm. So number one, you've bought exclusivity and bought me out and eliminate my opportunity cost of working with your top five competitors in any capacity for 12 months. So that's number one, which is why it's also, in my opinion, good to pick verticals for your brand deals of, if you're me, here is my email marketing sponsor if I'm gonna do that, or here's my web hosting sponsor. Here is my audio sponsor for like Epidemic Sound, or here's my live streaming software sponsor, um, you know, StreamYard. Or here is, and I don't work with somebody else in live streaming, or here is my podcast hosting platform that I uh, promote, whatever that would be. Or here is the microphone company that I work with, or here's the lighting company that I work with. Here is like, here are five product verticals or even 10 product verticals. And so that means I have the option of exclusivity and I can auction off that exclusivity. I can auction off, okay, video editing. Hey, Adobe, what's up? Like I could auction off exclusivity in that vertical and say, okay, I don't, mm -hmm. I don't mention the other video editing companies for 12 months. Well, that's worth $120,000 a year, almost even then, just right then and there on top of deliverables. I could say, hey, for 12 months, any content I do make surrounding our sponsorship, you can use those things and run and do ads. You can whitelist stuff for ads. I can option you licensing during that 12 month cycle for any of the video materials that are produced for 12 months after they're produced. So even mm -hmm. on month 12, you have 12 more months where you can use my likeness and my face from that whatever the last thing that was produced was. So that makes that worthwhile because it's a line item in, okay, exclusivity, that's opportunity cost for me. Licensing my face and my likeness in a limited cycle, not in perpetuity, but in a limited cycle of 12 months after publish, that's worth something because that extends a relationship and you can use that to generate revenue and sales using my credibility. Okay. So that is one more vertical there. And then um, the, another uh, vertical is, well, all right, we can talk about the creative control provisions in, do you have you, your ad reads are in the first third of the video 
instead of in the second third or the final third of the video. Your ad reads, we can negotiate on, okay, if it's more deliverables, the ad reads can be shorter. If it's less deliverables, I can let them be longer. So we can mm -hmm. negotiate between 30, 60, and 90 seconds on ad reads. In my case, I know that I'm making videos that are 16 to 20 minutes anyway. So how bad is it to give you a minute or 90 seconds? Because it's not even a tenth of the video. So right. the audience can't complain too much. We have to negotiate. Like, And what I would negotiate is uh, I get to turn on ads from day one. And the most I'm willing to do is in as far as Google will let me, uh, try to block some of your competitors from running ads during on on the on videos on my channel, and that's about right. as far as I can go to help you on that. But I'm gonna other than that, let me take my ad revenue, or I gotta charge you even more than the hundred thousand or hundred twenty thousand a year. And so mm -hmm. again, and then it's just well, how many deliverables do y'all want? And is it just my YouTube channel? What about the rest of my social media? What about my email list? What about my Instagram? What about my Twitter? And so you tell me, Justin, did I structure? Like a hundred thousand dollars. Okay, because I didn't even go into the full details of how someone charges a hundred thousand. But I did I structure a yeah. hundred thousand dollar brand deal correctly. So the way I look at this is, I think that there's definitely the the building blocks of a really compelling opportunity for a brand there. However, I would argue uh, something slightly differently um, to make it way more than that, Roberto. Because um, I actually believe that the the key to charging six figures for a single brand relationship is not really about the amount of volume of work that you're actually going to deliver to them. It's that number is two things. It's one is being associated with you, not just your name and likeness. It's being associated with you. You have you, in, at least in my opinion, and I think a lot of people is that you are looked at as kind of the, the creator advocate on the internet, right? You're, you're looking out for people, you're helping them make money or talking about work-life balance, mental health, all this stuff. And so for a brand to be associated with you, even loosely is extremely valuable because that rubs off on their reputation. And so at that point, it's, it has nothing to do with the deliverables. It doesn't matter if you're doing five videos or 10 videos or 15 or 200, right? It's because they are associated with their, maybe there's a section on their website where they can say, Roberto Blake is an ambassador of our brand or whatever. Right. Right. And so that's one thing. And then the other thing, too, is that having you as a backstop for them where they can say, hey, maybe once a quarter, you're going to get on a call with our full marketing team and you're going to advise us on our marketing strategy. Right. So at that point, it's again, not about the deliverables. It's about being able to tap into your expertise. It's the relationship. It's the relationship. And that that's what you're charging for. And so that's one of the things that I you know, teach my students in my courses and on my channel and stuff like that is that you have to get out of this box and being like, everyone wants to be like, Hey, here's this little box brand. And I'm going to stuff you in here. This is the only way yeah. you can work with me. <laughs> right. And, and the moment that you just like explode the box and just put some dynamite in it and explode it. Yes. You could start, you could start thinking about all these other ways this. in which you can, you can provide value to a brand. I love this. And for those of you just tuning in or uh, who have been listening on double speed, <laughs> this is Justin Moore, the creator wizard himself. Make sure you're checking him out. I've linked in the description and in the show notes to his newsletter that's going to give you great opportunities uh, and make you aware of brand deals each and every week. And he teaches a great course on brand deals. I haven't taken it myself, but I've heard nothing but good things about it. And this is uh, the guy. This is the guy. And he has the, the right experience because he's been on the agency side and the creator side as a decade of experience. And he knows what he's talking about. And I'm just enjoying our conversation and our back and forth here. And no, that's great. And I love that you said that. It's like what we always talk about. It's your skills and abilities, and it's also your expertise and the fact that you can expand the relationship. One of the things I do in my media kit, one of the things I do in my media kit is I list out a lot of these different opportunities for brands to work with me. I can be a host at your event, or I can help work your booth, or I can incorporate you into an article on LinkedIn where I have a much higher reputation value than just a passive YouTube view that might be, you know, someone blowing off steam. It's like the LinkedIn stuff is very valuable. And I'm one of the mm -hmm. only people in the industry that has more than 10,000 followers in LinkedIn. Um, so like, and that, cause 10,000 followers in LinkedIn is equivalent to like a hundred thousand in YouTube. Like mm. people don't realize that having an email list is like having a hundred thousand people in YouTube. People don't realize that, mm -hmm. um, an email list scale proportionately, you know, this, if you have 10,000 people on email list, that's a hundred thousand dollar email list 
people I know who make seven figures, they have 100,000 people on their email list. They have 50 to 100,000 people minimum to make seven figures. You have 5,000 to 10,000 minimum you make you know, to make $100,000. The email list is extraordinarily valuable. Email oh, lists can even be valuable for sponsorships. I know people who charge five grand for a sponsorship of their newsletter. Let me, I, let me, let me tell you, I, I'll give you real numbers. I just inked a newsletter sponsorship. I, mm -hmm. okay. I have, uh, just over 3000 creators on my newsletter now, mm -hmm. and I just landed a $2,000 sponsorship for four email blasts. Okay. So this is a, a perfect That's example great. of because That's, I love when it. I, yeah, when I started the newsletter, I, I wasn't thinking like, oh, I'm going to like monetize this through sponsorships, but it just, because I'm like, uh, like curating uh, a community of it's it's a very specific type of creator. It's someone who is yes. business minded, who's wanting to make money, who's looking for brand, you know, uh, trying to diversify their revenue stream. So that likely persona, already making money. Yeah, likely already ma making money and looking to will probably purchase software subscriptions per, you because know, they're taking products. it seriously because they're taking it seriously. They're just not they're not someone messing around on TikTok, right? And so it's like that to a to a creator economy startup or a brand who is looking to get in front of creators is very or, valuable yeah. to premium audience, right? Or a creator a creator driven um, software as a service product and everything like that. A StreamYard, a TubeBuddy, a VidIQ, a whoever, yeah, well, like Epidemic other, Sound, any number of there's like twenty. Yes different various service-based oriented companies exactly. that specialize in creators right now. There's more than 20 to 30 mm -hmm. of them. And now we have uh, about a really like five I really like, but there's like 10 or 20 creator economy startups. So there's like five that I'm really aware of that I really like a lot. So yeah. And, and the other, the other thing too, is that any creators in like listening to this about if you have, you thinking like, oh, I have like a really specific niche. Like uh, why would I need a newsletter? All this stuff. Like, let me, let me tell you <laughs> my, <laughs> My we'll again, my newsletter is all about sponsorships. That's all it's about. And I had the last time I launched my the cohort of my course, I had twenty two hundred around twenty two hundred creators on there, and I made forty two thousand dollars from the course launch. So, like, I love it. Listen to that. Listen to that. Like, if you have premium products, courses, things like that, it doesn't matter the size of your audience. If you are de like delivering something that's has like tremendous value to the community that you serve, I guarantee you that my uh, upcoming book. Uh, create something awesome. My upcoming book that releases in August of 2022, hopefully it releases on time. Uh, like the, that's the plan. My book, I guarantee you that my audience can make me an Amazon bestseller through my email list or through my Twitter alone that I guarantee yes. it. I guarantee it. And that's powerful. And the thing is every creator should be looking at something like that. I'm also going to be encouraging more creators, even entertainment based creators to, to consider self-publishing, if not trying to get a publishing deal, consider self-publishing and let your audience support you and be able to add bestseller to your bio for the rest of your life, or at least be able mm -hmm. to add author to your bio for the rest of your life. Watch what happens though. You get to add author or bestseller your value on brand deals and sponsorships will increase. And if you want to do public appearances or speaking engagements, whether you're entertaining or educating, your value goes up the minute you have a book and the minute that you're, you can say bestseller, even if it's Amazon bestseller, your value goes up. Like mm -hmm. watch the value skyrocket. Watch how serious people take you skyrocket. It's also a good way to get verified in Instagram finally is to be a book author. <laughs> you can finally get verified. If you're a bestseller right. or a book author, you have an ISBN number, you can finally get into Wikipedia and you can finally get that Instagram verified badge. <laughs> That's going to be my secret to doing it. Yeah. But we got a mm -hmm. great, we got a super chat from uh, Scott T. Um, Auric Unity, $10 super chat. Thank you for the donation. We always appreciate the financial support. Uh, too much value here. Found Justin from Berto's Twitter. Justin's newsletter is fire. It is. It is indeed. And so one of the other good reasons to have a newsletter is, I mean, we have to talk about this. It's not super controversial, but I know people feel some kind of way about it. Look, there's, there is, excuse me, just the possibility, whether you're intentional or not, that your platform can be compromised in some way. And that mm -hmm. doesn't mean you're shadow banned or demonetized, although those things do happen and wrongfully sometimes but it could also now, unfortunately, you have to worry a lot more about hackers and phishing schemes and uh, things like that. So mm -hmm. your newsletter and email list is the direct access to let your community know what is going on with you. And social media doesn't let you DM every single person following you to avoid spam purposes and things like that. That's why YouTube took away our messaging on the back end of, of the stuff. And so uh, if anything happens, having a way to let your audience know what's up and reach your most diehard followers is very important. I, I did yeah. it. I, one of my best performing videos over the last two years was a video about social media is over, why you need a newsletter and an uh, mm. a email list and a website. Like, mm -hmm. And that video did like 180,000 views because people wow. were feeling it. People were uh, mm -hmm. feeling the anxiety because – 
people found any number of things that they were true about, even when they were advocating for things that are sensitive topics, advocating for mental health or, or victims or abuse. They were finding that the thing that I'm talking about that's terrible that happened to somebody triggered an algorithm somewhere. And so I can't even speak up like in some cases, or you can't speak up as a victim or, or to protect victims sometimes without being shadow banned or suspended or it was ridiculous. Now things right. have improved or God forbid impersonations happen in sometimes and then stuff gets flagged. It's like things have improved on some of those fronts and sometimes not. And, and it just depends. And the goalpost keeps moving. That is right. terrifying. So again, the best thing you could do is say, no matter what, if you Google me, you're going to find my website. Or if you type my name in or my brand in, you're going to find my website. And I have this newsletter so that I can reach 3,000, 10,000 people. And God forbid I ever have to start over. It's not from zero. Yeah. And, you know, the other really like kind of cool byproduct of having a newsletter, this is very much like a, a, aligns with kind of my perspective on the creator space, which is that I like a lot of creators look at it from this scarcity mindset where it's just like it's a zero sum game. Like if that person is doing well or getting a sponsorship like that, somehow that's bad for me. And my perspective is like that is this is growing the creator economy for more and more dollars to be being poured into this with venture capitalists as well as advertisers like this benefits everyone and so the, one of yes. the cool things about having a an email list that i actually didn't realize until i started growing mine is that i can highlight people that i love creators who are yes. doing cool stuff you know like oh this person's doing a workshop or this watch this video i think it's amazing like and i can have three thousand people go and like watch this video from this person that I, and it's like i don't care about getting money in return or like anything it's more just like i love being able to have a platform so i can rise like grow i like, take you know raise other people up you know i take pride when i share somebody else's thing in my like community tab in youtube and then it becomes their most watched video of all time like, I, I'm sorry, but I take a little bit of pride when my audience does that for somebody, when my audience yeah. does that for somebody and I promote, like there was a, there was a small YouTuber, uh, I think two or three years ago that, uh, has since kind of like what he starts doing is now he does personality dissections or personality analysis of influencers and content creators. Uh, I shared one or two of his videos. You probably know who I'm talking about. I shared one or two of his videos in the early days of his stuff in my community tab and he they, they instantly became his most watched videos well i i must say i have personal experience with this because you also shared the video that i made analyzing your brand deal strategy and same thing like I, it did like way better than the outsized performance relative to my other videos so i, I could speak firsthand on on that and, and it would deserve you know? and the thing is your content deserved and it deserved to reach a wider audience and i was flattered and i really liked what you did and it was like it was smart you, you literally used the correct information from all of my videos uh about it and added your own insights to it i think you accurately predicted what my future like revenue turned out to be or something like that because i ended up doing like um over a hundred thousand dollars in brand deals uh last year i think it i think the final number now that i've tallied it is like something like one hundred sixty thousand. i have to do my wow. how much i earned last year video i still haven't done that i'm late on that video but like uh i think it was in brand deals and brand deals was 160 000. for the entire year of 2021 it was four hundred thousand versus 20 uh 20 was three hundred thousand. so uh, 25 percent i think growth or some 25 or 30 percent growth or something like that tremendous couldn't have expected that especially in yeah. pandemic year like right. yeah, great so i'm not complaining at all but it's like it's one of those things where it's like i realized that wait a minute i could have done a quarter million in brand deals <laughs> like you know, like it's um so like it, and again it was also i analyzed and i watched every video on your channel from everybody else that I know about everyone I know. I watched the videos about everyone I know. I was like, aha. And so I, there were some things even I picked up. I was like, hmm. And so there, there's a, there's so much value in being able to share other people's content and highlight it. And it's not about taking any credit for their success. It's just about knowing that your communities are aligned mm -hmm. and knowing that you can have the impact outside of your own brand to affect mm -hmm. somebody else like that, which is also what the sponsors and brands are looking for. They mm -hmm. are looking for your ability to elevate someone outside of yourself. And will your audience take your word seriously enough to do something about it? Mm -hmm. With that in mind, I have a segue question for you. Yeah, You've worked as an insider. We have a rare scoop here. You've worked as an insider in agency. <laughs> Tell me what a brand wants, what a brand needs. <laughs> like, Whatever I didn't know there was going to be a, a happy and makes yeah. me money. <laughs> like, 
I didn't know there was going to be a musical interlude, but I'm here for it. Um, and so I'm thankful for my sponsors yeah, supporting me. Up. Let's do it. Let's <laughs> what a it brand going. wants. What a brand needs. <laughs> I'm so serious. okay, I might pay for so I might pay. Uh, oh, wait, I gotta call Peter Hollins. He'll make the cover for me. Yes, exactly, man. It's gonna go platinum. I can text Peter. Yeah. So here's the deal. This is a like one of the most critical thing takeaways that I want everyone listening to to hear from this, which is that brands do and agencies do a huge amount of tire kicking on your social presence before they ever reach out to you. Okay, so this is the way it works. So let's say that a brand decides like, oh, we want to run an influencer campaign. They will yeah. call up their agency and they'll say, hey, agency, we want to run an influencer campaign. Can you put it put together a strategy for us? So the influencer agency says, okay, I'm going to, you know, they go back in their cave and they do their strategy. They come back to the brand. They said, hey, we think you should work with 10 YouTubers. Like YouTube is the platform that we should activate on. The brand says, okay, great. Go find us a short list of people that you think would be good. So the agency goes back and they say, okay, let's develop a short list of 25 people, right? And then they go back to the brand. They go to your, and then basically what they do is they go and they search <laughs> using either software, which is called like uh, so, like influencer discovery software. There's all these platforms out there. that Is there any software to. that you know that they're using that a lot of them are using? Um, so the, a lot, what most of them are doing these days are using the self-service influencer platforms like Aspire IQ, hashtag paid, um, a lot of these like CRM type tools that allow them to do a uh, discovery filter by geography, demographics, and so on. I um, pay so, for one of them myself. I use yeah. Hype Auditor. Hype Auditor. Yeah. I, I pay it's, three. It's, I pay 300 a month and I yeah. to see how it plays to see how it plays from the other side. And so that's the point is that like, you know, they use the software and so they're stealing your profile photo. They're taking your bio your, from your about section and they're putting it into their deck in that before they ever reach out to you. And then they're going to the brand and they're saying, hey, we think Roberto and these other 25 creators are going to be great. And so the brand says, OK, we like these five. Go reach out to them. And then the, the agency reaches out to you. Yep. So imagine what just happened. You do not have – a lot of creators think that when the brand is reaching out or the agency is reaching out that that's the first time this agency is, like, ever thinking about them. No, they already, like, did a huge and robust analysis. And and the, you probably already have a soft green light and thumbs up from the brand to work with you. And so you're in a tremendous position to negotiate. You have a lot of leverage because – and a lot of times the brand has already said, like, let's work with them. Right? There are brands and that have, I've found out, I've talked to friends who work at companies and they've told me that some brands have whitelist and that they have what I refer to as like a bingo book mm. of like, these are people who are clean and safe to work with and always deliver. Yep. And these are highly high profile targets and everything. And they have like a bingo book. It's like, you know, it's like, it's practically like they have a bounty on your head. It's like a go get them. Well, and it's also, they also have the opposite, Roberto. They've got the other type of list. They've got, don't work with those creators. They're posting controversial stuff on their YouTube channel or on their Instagram, you know, clickbait stuff or what. You or know, they've been difficult like, to work with or so on. Or they've been difficult Dama. to work with. Yes, exactly. And so it's just like that you have to have that perspective because like if you are difficult in any way <laughs> of like, you know, some historical relationship that they work with you in, in years past or something. So again, the big takeaway here is that like you need to be analyzing your social platforms with a very objective eye. Like if there was a brand landing on your plat, they're not going to watch 10 of your videos. They're going to watch 30 seconds of one of them. Okay. And so like, you have to understand that that and realize like any piece of content that you put out there is fair game for them to just land on it, watch 30 seconds and be like, yes, this is the person, this is a good person for us. Mm -hmm. Right. And so I, that might be hard to hear, but it's reality. It, okay? Oh yeah. I went through right. um, a brand safety checklist of like nine light line items that can hurt your ability to work with a brand. And people were, I even made a print out of it and gave it to people at Vid Summit. I made a print out of it. And like, people were like, oh my God, this is so useful. This is thankful. And you're giving me this for free and it's a printout. It's like, yeah, and my website's on the bottom. Like, and uh, I made the content like 99, like 95% of the print. And then the bottom 5% of the print is my website, awesomecreatoracademy.com. So it's like, so uh, by the way, you can feel free to steal that tactic and make print flyers when you go to events. Like uh, I'm going to, I've got, I'm, yeah. I'm making one with like an NFC or NFC chip on it. So you can just, Ooh, it and it goes to my, that's my fancy. newsletter URL. That's Boop. fancy. I like that. Yes. That's, Dude. that's fancy. Dude. I like it. Yeah. I'm good. I'm good with QR codes too. I'm like, people think yeah, it's yeah. like old fashioned. I'm like, I'm down. I'm down. Especially yeah. after we saw Coinbase. Like I'm like, yeah, they broke right, the right, website. Exactly, yeah, right. yeah. I'm like, bring it back. <laughs> We're bringing it back. Um, we're taking it back. So no, I love that you said that. I love that you brought up like how brands operate on the inside and what they're looking for. Um, 
I've always had this thesis and I don't think that like, I do not believe that brands set out to screw over influencers. I do believe it happens sometimes, but I find that influencers underprice themselves more than brands lowball them. Brands often will like, if an influencer says, here's how much I want, a lot of times a brand goes, okay. And it's the influencer that's undermining themselves on price a lot of time. I hear people say all the time, and I've said, I'll just tell you, like some of my experience, I've had people, especially people who reach out to me, women, people of color, and they'll say, hey, I feel like I'm getting lowballed based on like my identity or optics or all that. And then I ask, who gave a price, you or them? I did. How are you being lowballed if you're giving the price off of that? Well, so-and-so got more and they should have paid me more. It's like, it's not someone's responsibility to pay you what somebody else is getting if you asked for less. And you have to know, let me help you tell you what you're worth and how to get what you want. And what you're worth is basically, here's what you want. Let's figure out how to get it or let's walk. Because I've heard people, they say, well, they say they only have this budget. I'm like, you didn't push and you didn't ask the right questions in the negotiating point. And again, some people, they take it, they eventually listen to me, believe it or not. They take it very hard. They take it very personally, but I'm like, but they know I have their best interest at heart. That's the important thing. And I'm like, I'm not even charging them sometimes for this. And I'm like, I say this to people I know who I have a great relationship with. And I go, I believe that you could have gotten this amount. And I'm like, and if you think that what you deserve is so-and-so, what if I told you that so-and-so, you you think that's a fair deal. Yeah, I should be getting that. They're not even charging what they're supposed to. They're charging 30 to 50% less than what they could have gotten and you think that that's a good deal because you want their deal, they're not even pricing themselves right. And then they go, mm. okay, tell me more. If that's not cap, tell me more right. and tell me why you say that. And I'm like, well, let's look at what you didn't sit ask for. I ask them because they can't, they can't, some things they can't talk about because of NDA, but I ask the right questions. We go through line items and I'm like, you never asked this question. You never pushed on this. You never offered them this thing that would change the nature of the contract right that for the thing that you're doing that's the budget you didn't change the parameters of the deal which would mm-hmm. change the budget the budget right. exists within the parameters of the deal as it exists and as it's structured is 100%. the way i explain it to people yeah there's more budget if the parameters change it's paying for this versus paying for that right and you don't know what you don't know well the thing is <clears throat> i think there's a couple different current like kernels of, of gold nuggets in here, which is that number one, um, most people are get very trapped into this competitive pricing mindset where it's just like the only way in which they know how to base their pricing is based on what their friend is charging, right? They like go to a creator. Oh, you're a similar size as me. Like, I guess I should be charging around the same as you. And one of my favorite pieces of advice, which is very actionable to most creators is that what most people do is that a brand comes to them and they say, Hey, like how much for one integrated YouTube video, <laughs> right? Or something very standard like that. And the creator just spits back out a number. Oh, it's going to be 2000 whatever, right? So not to mention all the other things you should be asking about usage rights, exclusivity, yada, yada, <clears throat> which like you said, can change the nature of the deal. Um, the, the easiest way to get more money and get more budget is to ask some very simple questions. So first and foremost, uh, h- how many other creators are you working with on this deal? And they say, oh, you know, we're looking to partner with 10, you know, 20 influencers. Okay. So you say, oh, interesting. So the proposal that you come back to them with is, yeah, you know, package one where you want me to just do one video. Yeah, that's going to be that's going to be the budget you said 2000. But package two, I could actually make three videos for you. Package three, I could actually make 10 videos for you. And your creator and your head, you're thinking in your head like, well, they didn't even ask for that. Well, that's the point. The point is that now they're thinking in their head. They're like, wow, we could actually hire Roberto for 10 videos and then we don't have to work with those other nine people. It's one contract, right? It's one email thread. He makes our life easier. We know he's reliable. And so Again, all it took was oh, one question. Oh, and we question. have multiple like recurring hit points instead of yes. being spread out. It's like multiple touch exactly. points with the viewer. Yeah. And you tell them like, I'm more than willing to meet with your team quarterly. We'll go and analyze the success and results of the last campaign. We'll adjust. We'll make course corrections. We'll update the brief. We'll update the call to action to try something slightly different. You could say, hey, I got a bunch of comments on the last video where they at they were saying, hey, Roberto, I wish you would have like talked about this feature a little bit more. Boom. There's some new content you create for the next pulse. Bingo. Right. And so it's just, there's so many different ways in which you can, you know, again, the other advantage of having like a package strategy um, is is that you can price anchor them. So they, you know, yeah, maybe yes. package three is 
you know, thirty thousand dollars, and they said their budget was three thousand. But package two is starting to look pretty nice now, <laughs> by comparison. That like, oh, ten thousand. Actually, that maybe we could like stretch our budget to get. And to the that, other thing know? is, don't like you can you can use questions to drag out. You don't have to go to pricing immediately. You can also even like pitch the creative, and then you can uh, like you know even and sometimes you can just ask them what the budget is. And then you can start to move the goalpost and the needle based on that and saying, because one of the things I've told people is like, if you, if the brand is on your white list already, if it's on your dream 100 list of relationships and it's a yes for you already, start the call very early with all the reasons that you're, you and the brand are a great fit and how great it is, especially if they reached out to you first and mm -hmm. thank them for that and say, look, the thing is, I want to work with y'all. And then you give them the creative pitch on here's what I'm envisioning and you sell them on the vision. And you've also yep. said yes. And then you say, okay, let's talk logistics. What do deadlines look like? All right. How many people are you working with? What do you need? And the thing is, well, and then you say, Hey, remember, I already said yes to you. I, I already want to work with you. I just need to be straight with me. What's the budget look like? And I'm going to tell you what we can do. Cause mm -hmm. like, and you've already crafted this great vision. You've already got them sold on this vision, wanting that. Now it's their game to lose, and they did yep. come to you. And that's mm -hmm. a really strong position to negotiate with, to be able to ask for what the budget is. And the thing right. is, you haven't laid out all your cards in terms of all the options, all the exclusivity, all of that, which means if the budget doesn't meet, meet the number that's sitting in your head, or God forbid, even if it exceeds the number you were thinking of, you still have wiggle room to throw in mm -hmm. options to sweeten the pot, or you can yep. ask for, okay, and you can say, typically what I would do for what all we've discussed already and for the vision that I painted on the deliverables and the creative, it would normally be this price. What can we do to get there or closer to that? And what mm. do you need from me? Or did you remember that I have these other platforms? Did you, like those are strong and you tell me, is that not like, you know, tell me if that's a strong place to negotiate from. The, the other, yeah. I mean, the, the other thing that I think is really, uh, critical. There's this concept called value stacking, which is that um, you don't lead with the price. <laughs> if you lead with the price, it's always going to feel like a, an expense to them. You don't want them to feel like it's going to be an expense. You want it to feel uh, my favorite, like little uh, kind of vocabulary, you know, kind of hack, I guess, is that any you're never again, are you going to say the price is this the cost, the fee, the rate, take that all that vocabulary out. No, it's the investment. The investment ding, 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 is going to be 10,000. Because what does that imply? That implies they're going to get a return <laughs> on this investment. I need a that bell sound you. effect to celebrate yeah, when you dude, say stuff like we that. Get, <laughs> exactly. Because honestly, the other thing too is that when you think about all of the, the value that you're going to provide to them, yeah, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. I'm going to help you think through your marketing strategy. I'm going to do this many posts. I'm going to yada, 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 boom, boom, <laughs> boom, 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 boom. Here's all the things. And then, oh, by the way, the investment is going to be 10K. Right. And so again, you're not leading with the, with how much it's going to cost them. You're leading with all this. Uh, like, so like you said, there's this amazing book that I want to recommend everyone listen to uh, or, or read. It's called a hundred million dollar offers by Alex Ramosi. Uh, and it, the I subtitle love his is, channel. I love yes, his YouTube channel. Alex's channel is amazing. And the subtitle is how to make offers so good that people feel stupid or dumb saying no. And it's just like, it's this concept of like, how can you just like smack them over the head with all this value that they're going to get? And then they just feel like idiots not saying, not accepting this. And so it's very much in alignment with what you're saying. It's just like, you have to think about this stuff when, when you're getting into these negotiations. Speaking of value and value stacking, you can also do value stacking in your own brand and in your own optics, because here's part of a point of leverage and people don't understand points of leverage. What's the value of you promoting yourself instead of promoting them? How much mm -hmm. money do you stand to make? And is that clear? I'll give you a primary example. Uh, with the coaching and things I offer, I don't even offer a course yet. It's coming. Like more than one, uh, they're coming. But I don't offer a course yet. But even just buying 90 minutes of my time is hundreds of dollars. It could border up to a thousand. Doing a multiple call package with me is multiple thousands of dollars. And that number after this year and after inflation, I'm doing a hold on pricing for inflation up until the end of 2022. So in 2023, my rates go up. So I'll give you a break on inflation, but for a limited time, <laughs> for a limited time only. So buy me now, I'm cheap. Uh, but uh, I digress. The point is that I tell creators in general, from a monetization standpoint, that they should have their own product ecosystem, whether that's merch, digital stuff, um, exclusive things, even fan things of like, hey, uh, like even if you don't do coaching, offer fans a buy-in to some exclusive experience where there's only 10 people that get on a call with you, build 
pricing, high ticket pricing into a fan club for like hardcore fans only set up things where they get massive discounts on your deep discounts on your merch or you literally even send them like you can create a big package where like a couple times a year you literally send only 20 people like a freaking ship them like a crate of stuff from your brand and stuff like that but also they get access to live calls with you or whenever you do an event they get a free ticket and that's like a big thing and they can pay for that recurring and the reason you want to do this is you want to up the value of your own ecosystem and you want to put yourself in an ecosystem position either on volume or value of it hey if i want ten thousand dollars I could promote my own thing to my audience and make that money. So if a brand wants to work with you and you want more than $10,000, I would say that's like, if you can prove and it's obvious that your own brand promoting your own brand is worth that for a single video or more, that's a very good position of negotiating. That's a very good position of leverage of, you know, if you offered me five grand, the thing is, if I get one sale for myself on my highest value offer, I make seven grand. So five grand isn't going to do it for me to give up some creative control. I could just make a mm -hmm. video of my own, uh, I, no deadlines, no pressure. So it's got to be more than that. That's a good position of leverage. Mm -hmm. You might not even have to ask if you already have made your, your own brand valuable enough because mm -hmm. also it's the headache for you. If you mm -hmm. know in your heart of hearts, because I price somewhat on my boundaries, like Justin, I price a little bit based on my boundaries. And if you know in your heart and hearts, you know what? I can just make a video that my audience is going to love and my audience is going to support me directly. It becomes harder in some ways to take less money. And that's a good place to be of that's 100%. not enough money to motivate me to like put something in front of my audience that's not just myself. Because the higher the value is of you just rocking with your audience and doing it within your own brand, then you get more boundary and leverage to say, that's not worth it for me to um, make a video that I didn't specifically have it in my heart to make on my own. Right. Well, I mean, I think the there's actually they actually have a, a a term for this in negotiation psychology called your BATNA, which is your best alternative to a negotiated agreement. And so it's this exact concept that you're discussing, which is that let's say you're in a sponsorship negotiation, and you know what it what is your best alternative to a negotiated agreement? Well, if you can't make this deal work with this brand, like you said, you go out and you make a video for yourself. <laughs> you have maybe you have affiliate revenue streams, you have other digital products, you have whatever. You have these other things waiting in the wings, and so you're not desperate to take this deal. The creators ask me all the time, like, well, you know, what are the red flags of like walking away from a deal? And like one of the biggest ones is that you don't have any alternatives. You have to do this deal to pay your rent or like pay your car bill or something next month. Yeah. And like that's never a good position to be in. And so one of the best ways to be able to feel confident asking for more money on sponsorships and things like that is to build up some of these other revenue streams so that you are diversified. Exactly. I like having a bunch of um, affiliate revenue streams like my two biggest affiliate revenue streams pay more than $2,000 a piece. One of them pays, as you know, two buddies, like over five grand. Kajabi's like uh, over two now. If I build up another uh, stream comparable, then it means that recurring monthly, I do nothing and I make money becomes 10 grand all of a sudden. That mm -hmm. pays the mortgage and some bills and like some things. That uh, doesn't necessarily pay my team, but that's what selling things are for. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, and then there's ad revenue and there's things like that. Ad revenue pays taxes, blah, blah, blah. So I structure... There are income streams designed there for every expense, every big expense that there is, there's a different solid income stream that can cover that. And I like those to almost be even as passive as possible. Mm -hmm. And then, so whatever I go out and work and hustle for with a brand or uh, an event or whatever it is, or, or even consulting, whatever it is, I like that to not be tied to something that is dependent that has to happen. I like to say, well, that lets me do something else that lets me invest somewhere else that lets me invest in equipment, a new team member that's like whatever it is or a project to hire contractors, whatever it is, right? I like the idea of knowing personally for me that even when I need to take a break during the pandemic, I didn't have to hustle and make the same amount of YouTube videos. I made less right. and I made less on ad, but actually, actually I made about the same on ad revenue, even with less uploads. Now that I think about it and less views, mm -hmm. uh, the value of the, uh, CPMs went up the, um, <laughs> The, the the thing is, though, the fact that my affiliate income was not changing in any drastic way made a big offset difference. My existing right. brand relationships and me fulfilling those made a difference. And the fact that I still was doing my coaching, my membership, my consulting, those things all worked 
out. So my income did not decrease. My potential might have compared to my uploads, but my overall income didn't increase. If anything, it increased. Right. But so did the value of my brand equity too. And so there's a lot of things creators can do to protect their income. And this is why, as much as it's said otherwise, this can be more stable eventually and more reliable as long as you do it through the correct methods that right. we're talking about that we frequently teach. Mm -hmm. It can be more stable Absolutely. than a nine-to-five job because more would have to go wrong in the world than a boss screwing up the business or the economy or regulations screwing up the business or yep. some or the politics of the company and your supervisor deciding they don't like you. Right. Or you offended them or or whatever, or that you weren't productive enough today for whatever reason. You can be fired on a whim. You can be fired mm -hmm. through no fault of your own. It is much more difficult for your creator income streams to vanish and you will have more than a 24 hour heads up if it's going to happen for the most part. Right. <laughs> so 100%. you will know. So I, th I think that the creator economy is great. I think that what you're doing is amazing. You know, I'm a big fan of yours. Um, Appreciate this is going to uh, be uh, like more or less the end for the audio version. I know you have to uh, like run, but uh, do you have time for like five minutes of Q and A um, yes, sir. outside the audio for our live audience only. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to queue up our exit music. I want to thank everybody. I want to thank the audio only listeners. We're going to go to the live Q and A. This is why you want to be subscribed on YouTube. You want to join us whenever we're live, set on those notifications. You never know what I'm going to be up to and who I'm going to bring on, but we're going to move to that and I'm going to do the outro. You guys stay awesome and we'll catch you on the next one. This episode has ended, but your creative journey continues. Visit createsomethingawesometoday.com and access all links and resources mentioned in today's show, all designed to help you create something awesome today. All right. And now welcome everybody to the after show. Thank you so much for dropping in tonight, Justin, uh, especially since it was somewhat last minute. Really appreciate you. Yeah, dude. Uh, yeah, we've got time for uh, at least like five minutes or so of Q and A. If you are in the live audience, we see a bunch of you here. Uh, we've got literally like about fifty like people that can ask questions here in the live. So let's do it. How how'd you enjoy uh, the podcast today, Justin? Dude, it was I, I was love. I I literally could talk about sponsorships until the day I die. This is like one of my most favorite things to talk about. I never get bored of it. Uh, like, honestly, it's, it's, uh, I don't know. I wake up every day excited to talk about this stuff, which is maybe bizarre, but, uh, no, it's, that's, uh how much, that's how much I love it. <laughs> I, I wake up every day, uh, wanting to talk about, uh, the creator economy, nerd stuff and money. Mm. Like I'm serious. Mm -hmm. I like, I want to talk Marvel and star Wars. I want to talk about investing and building new income streams. And oddly enough, I want to talk about like, Weirdly, I, I sometimes I actually want to talk about taxes, like um, <laughs> largely how to pay less of them and yep. why we should pay less of them. And uh, then I um, I love talking about creativity, workflows, video editing, live streaming, all all the stuff. So uh, really appreciate it. Uh, we have a question here that I think you'll. This question might trigger you. Is it oh. okay for brands to contractually own the content they request via affiliate deals and ambassador programs? Ooh, that's triggering. Okay. Right? Triggered. Um, no, yeah. it's not. Yeah. Um, like Facts. for a brand to own, like we've talked about, you know, in, in quite a bit of detail, it's like there is so much tremendous value in the content that you create beyond just the fact that you're out there promoting them. For no flat fee, it's like basically all the benefit is a lot of the benefit is going to them because they only have to pay you out when you actually make a conversion for them. So that's like the most ideal scenario for most brands if you're willing to do that and kind of be their marketing foot soldiers out there. Um, and so like the fact that you're also allowing them to repurpose the content whether it's organically on their social channels or using it for paid advertising or whatever, there's no way that that like the amount of money that you're making through the affiliate deal is anywhere near adequate to compensate you for that. And so if there's ever a scenario where you're, tr you're wanting to join an affiliate program and that's a term of the deal, never join it. 
like cancel Correct. that. Don't be part of it. Um, like if there is a scenario where you're able to modify the terms of the affiliate partnership, where you can say like, I, you know, I'd love to be an affiliate for you, but if there's ever a scenario where you want to repurpose the content that I'm creating for you, that's going to be an additionally negotiated, you know, uh, paid partnership basically. Um, and so that's kind of, that's kind of how I would approach that. Perfect answer. Thank you for that. <laughs> well, there we go. Yeah. Mike asks, Justin, never heard of you till now. What's the first video I should watch on your channel? This is an excellent question. Ooh, love it. Well, great to meet you, Mike. Um, I have a video on my channel that I think you'll really like, which is called Secret Words to Make Brands Pay You More. Um, oh, I and like it's this. Focused, it's focused all around vocabulary. And, you know, this we talked briefly about this idea about like, oh, rate, cost, fee. No, it's investment, right? So it's a whole video dedicated to like what not to say and, and other ways in which, you know, injecting a certain phrase or word can actually transform your brand partnership. So I think that's a good one. Yep. Uh, AJ Bishop says, are unpaid affiliate programs a waste of time? Unpaid affiliate programs sound illegal. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's not actually an affiliate program. They're just giving you a discount code to buy their products at a discount. Yeah, <laughs> and do not, like in my mind, I mean, if you just want free product and you need that to make content, I don't have an issue when you're small doing what you need to do to make content that you can't afford to make otherwise. So I don't have a big deal with that, but mm. I do have a problem if they contractually obligate you to do anything. So if there's no money, as far as I'm concerned, if there's no money, there's no contract. Mm -hmm. Yep. And the exception I have on that is when the product is hundreds of dollars or where it starts to edge up to $500,000. And also theoretically, there may be, uh, remind me, when it's something of that level of nature, <laughs> there is something you have to do with disclosing that as in kind for tax purposes, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, so I mean, well, first and foremost, like any time that a brand is going to be paying paying you over six hundred dollars in a calendar year, you have to be submitting tax paperwork to them because they have to submit a ten ninety nine NEC form. It's like they're written in the weeds here, but like they have to tell the IRS that they paid you over six hundred dollars for a calendar year. And so, but if like, it's not when, cash, if it's if it's in kind product, yeah, you still have to disclose yeah. that. There's, I there's, usually. Yeah, I usually do, but I'm obsessive. Like I disclose yeah. things that are even fifty dollars or like whatever. A lot of but... people don't. A lot of people don't. I honestly am not sure what the threshold is, but like, yeah, you do need to be disclosing right now. Yeah, it, it I think was, it's still around. I think that. it was five yeah. before, but six currently is my understanding. Mm -hmm. But that's why I hire accountants because they figure that yeah, out. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but I also just disclosed everything in granular right. detail, and so when the IRS like screws up something, which they have, by the way, like I whine mm -hmm. about it and I complain because I'm like, I give you all everything. Everything I do is digital. Like you guys have no excuse. You should be right. perfect. <laughs> like right. you should be perfect. Um, and that's one of my frustrations. That's one of my gripes is I give you everything and right. you have everything. It's all digital. You have no excuse. I right. demand perfection. <laughs> yes. Angela yeah. says, what's the quickest way I can revitalize my channel after being away from about a month and a half? I would say don't worry about it so much. Um, there's only so much that you can do when you come back and start creating content. Like you should be able to take a little bit of time away if it's a mental health thing. Like I think that's really important. Um, I I've would just say, months. yeah. Like so, you know, and I, Roberto, you'll enjoy this. Like my current Creator Wizard channel, I didn't create content on it for six years. And I re-upload, I put a, slapped a fresh coat of, coat of paint on it and started pumping out new content. I had a previous channel from way back in the day, over 500 videos uh, sharing just general life advice, career advice, yep. this type of thing. And so um, you can always turn it around. And so I just wouldn't be too hard on yourself. Honestly. I, you know, I, even this podcast channel, I did something similar in the sense that like, there was like a whole year where we didn't like uh, more or less do the podcast uh, or it was very, very, very infrequent and it's back. And it's, and um, even with uh, some time we took off, I had, you know, my dogs passed away. I like took a break and then uh, come back and it's popping. It's fine. Same thing with my main channel. I've done months at a time. What, what I lost was the potential of the growth during that time. As far as revitalizing it, remember the content is the content. And people have this really superstitious thing about like, oh, this video will do this. And if I do a bad video, the next one will be. It's like, I've done so many binges of daily content just enough where I've uploaded seven videos in a row, six videos in a row, 12 videos in a row, so many times over so many years that I feel like I've like my entire channel existed to debunk this idea. Right. hundred like, percent. I've done so many times when I've taken two months off from YouTube more than one time in a year in the last two years, in the last two years, there's been more than one occasion where I've taken two months off from YouTube. I have debunked this notion and then come back and then hustled for a while 
before taking another break and uh <laughs> sprinted up from oh getting 2000 oh man you're only getting 2000 new subscribers a month there's channels with millions of subscribers that don't grow anymore their number stays mm -hmm. the same they don't even mm -hmm. get 2000 a month anymore net right. positive they lose so many that they gain like enough just to stay uh net positive in social blade and that makes them less depressed and and so right. I, i'm not naming names i'm just pointing something out it <laughs> happens it happens and you, hey no shade no tea they got million subs what like they got million subs three million subs six million subs it doesn't matter right. but the cool thing is is in my case there's never been in the entire time i've been on youtube uh consistently since 2013 when i started doing at least weekly content and started taking this seriously to build an audience there's never been a time where I didn't grow. There's never been a time where I didn't have net positive subscribers, more subscribers right. gained than lost. No single month in the last nine years or whatever it That's is. That's crazy. Like mm -hmm. like, yeah. So the, and, and so the good news is I know that the growth trajectory is always there. And I know that even after taking breaks, I've returned to a peak of 10,000 in a month, even after taking long breaks, the mm -hmm. content will drive it. Even, even if you can't be consistent, the content will drive right. it. Consistency works the best to not lose potential. I look at like dollar cost averaging in the stock market of, hey, there's a couple of days in the stock market where if you just were there and showed up and didn't time the market, you will make so much money because it has you didn't miss the best day of the year or the best eight days of the year. I think YouTube is the same where you might not want to miss the X amount of best days <laughs> of the year or miss three trends that are perfect in your niche by being around. But if you if you can't, you can't. Come back, do your best, make content that people will want to show up for or evergreen yeah. content that might be a slow burn to carry you. That's what I'm doing right now. I took a hiatus. I've come back and I've uploaded two videos uh, back to back this week. Hopefully I get a third out tonight. And they're all evergreen content. They're slow boner burners. They're slow burners, but every single one of them <clears throat> has basically been a five or six out of 10, but had a better trajectory than videos that eventually ended up with 40 or 50,000 total views over mm. a period of time. So they outperformed, even though they're not the best of the best of the best with honor, sir, they still outperformed videos that had a baseline, uh, 90 day threshold of 50 or 40,000 in 90 days. And the thing is at the end of the day, the lifetime or the 90 day count is more valuable to me than whatever it looks like in the first week. Cause it's, well, it, it also makes <clears> me more money. You, you know what the other interesting thing is that, you know, if you look at my channel, like I will do, you know, roughly between three to 600 views, not thousand, three to 600 views on my new uploads. But my audience is only creators. That's all creators who are looking to get sponsorships. Yes. Right. So if, again, if we're talking, if we're looking at niche audiences and my primary uh, like monetization strategy is not making money on AdSense or getting like millions of views on YouTube, it is monetizing in other ways, coaching, consulting my courses and things like that too. So if I have a, you know, 25% increase in my viewership, that like, if I look at like bottom of funnel in terms of people enrolling in my courses and things like that has a massive amount. Cause my courses are, you know, they're like more of a premium type thing. Right? Yes. And so again, like, I don't look at it from like, get really demoralized about how many views from oh, an exactly. absolute perspective that I'm getting. Right. And so it really comes down to your strategy as a business and as a creator yes. and the ways in which you're monetizing. And so if it's YouTube also, is, you know, it's also yeah. recognizing the total addressable market and the market cap for a topic. Like I know on my channel, there's an infinite market cap for making money online, but there is a 10,000 view market cap for me talking about brand deals, which is good news for you, by the way, because that means that the potential, the potential of if I can get 10,000 people to watch a video about brand deals, your potential to get more uh, brand deal customers for your courses and consulting and to get those views is i need to share more of your content but like right. it's higher <laughs> it's like it means that yeah. okay if right now a thousand is a great outlier if a thousand is a great outlier just knowing that the topic vertical that where you're at right now you can get 10 percent of the true value of the topic vertical because there are outlier videos out there there's a handful of outlier videos but they're from channels that are entertainment and not education. Right, exactly. Mm -hmm. Which means that they are even getting casual, curious people on that, but it's not the true market for that topic. And I'm good at identifying that nuance of, is this the true market for this content? Or is that a personality driven creator that can make anyone watch like paint drying? Right, right, exactly. Mm -hmm. Like there's some people that they can carry anything 
or that they make videos that make no sense, but they can get an audience for it, which means right. even when they do a serious topic, that's not the true addressable market for that topic. That's just mm -hmm. that creator's audience and the relationship they have with them. They'll watch anything. That they well, make. A, great <clears throat> a great example is Patty Galloway. You know, he has mm -hmm. make these amazing videos about these YouTubers and he has a huge percentage of his audience who is fans of that creator that he's analyzing. But the carryover, the spillover effect is that there's a lot of creators that watch him too. And so yes. they'll sign up for his wait list for his, you know, and you know, one-on-one -on -one se sessions and stuff like that. So it's the same logic there. And it, again, it goes back to who you're trying to serve. Exactly. There is in terms of, um, in terms of the potential market cap of truly serious potential full-time professional content creators. I would say that for, for any product that might be 500 to a thousand dollars, we have a total addressable market of about a hundred thousand customers and that's it. And the reason I say that is there are only 3000 YouTube, sorry, 300,000 YouTube channels with silver play buttons. And I'm not saying you have to have a silver play button to be serious, but more than like half of those channels are duplicates of creators that are established or people adjacent to them. And they have, and there's a bunch of them that are brands themselves, companies, Microsoft, Adobe, a lot of them have six play buttons, six silver play buttons. So I only believe there to be about maybe a hundred to 150,000 creators that have silver play buttons. Extrapolating from that in terms of the disposable income of those creators to invest specifically in one time purchases of education or consulting at 500 to a thousand dollars, even for them, that represents too much of their gross annual revenue after, or their even their net annual revenue. So I'm extrapolating from that. So I've have done right. statistics on this to where, from my point of view, like realistically, now the, the market gets bigger if it's under ninety nine dollars, right? But for something that's like again effort to value for folks like you and me, the overall total addressable sales market sales market can only be about a hundred hundred fifty thousand people globally and that's globally mm. so then mm. if you reduce it to an english-speaking market we have less than that so mm. that's how i look at it which means that the absurdity of having a thousand customers and having what might be like a thousand to fifteen hundred customers the absurdity of that and having wait i might own one percent of the entire buying market of the of the creator economy vertical of people over 500 to a thousand dollars well that's something that's like mm -hmm. we're doing something if we're doing that right. we're doing something mm -hmm. and you can go if you have that then the lifetime value of that audience could be a million dollars oh yeah it's funny <clears throat> it's funny like i recently created a mission for myself that i want to help Creators big and small land a million sponsorships by 2032. So in 10 years. That's a lot. And so it's a lot, right? And so it's like I, my mind gets really excited thinking about how the heck I'm going to make that happen, <laughs> right? Yeah. Um, and, but it's a really, I, the way I love to, the, the reason I chose that, the reason I chose 100,000 sponsorships and not, I mean, sorry, a million sponsorships and not a million uh, creators, because it's so much more exciting to me to help one creator get a hundred sponsorships and help them create a sustainable yes. income, then get, then a hundred people get one sponsorships. Right. And so it's just like, like just extrapolating that for your, everyone listening for your own business and your own career. It's like choosing your North star and your mission of how you're actually going to help people, um, like can inform your entire business strategy. So it is, it, it's actually very critical. I think mine is getting 10,000 creators to earning a hundred thousand dollars a year. Cause then we have a multi-billion dollar network. Yeah, I love we have a multi-billion-dollar ecosystem. We have some leverage at that point. We have leverage if it's like if we have an ecosystem within my community of people that I've helped, and the 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 sphere of influence that I have rippled to ten thousand people. That's already super super significant. Ten thousand people mm -hmm. making a minimum of a hundred thousand dollars a year, and then if our top uh, one percent of those people are making a million dollars a year, we have between us a billion-dollar ecosystem. We have a lot of buying power and capital and and power as that entity and as the professional class of the creator economy at that point and being mm -hmm. someone that helps be the progenitor of that helps be a catalyst or an advocate for that that gives us tremendous economic leverage and power to be able to uh speak up and have a collective voice within our industry 
and to yeah. push for the changes we want in the industry. And we would be able to elevate a lot of people, open a lot of doors, but we could also, um, you know, anything we don't think is good. And in the interest in the community, we have something we can do about it. That's true. hundred percent, dude. Yep. So we have what may be our last question here for the evening. Um, question, how do you overcome the nervousness of your first brand deal to speak confidently on what you can deliver? This is a great question. This is a really good one. Um, okay. So I think the most important thing about this is to realize that the nervousness is all in your head. You know, I think, you know, probably what, what's, what you're thinking is like, oh man, like this brand is going to think I'm an idiot or they're going to find out that I am an imposter. A lot of it comes from imposter syndrome is like thinking that somehow you're going to screw up or you're not, you know, you're not deserving of this or something like that. Uh, when in reality, the brand is probably thrilled. The brand is stoked, like whatever you're going to deliver to them, they're going to be excited about. Um, and so I know it's, it's nerve wracking in these early days. That That is actually one of the tips I give. And maybe this is a little controversial, Roberto, is that. I don't think there's really necessarily anything wrong with getting a few repetitions under your belt with free yes. products, right? If you're just, you know, getting understanding what the dynamics of working back and forth with a brand, creating content, all this stuff. I'm someone who like really advocates for getting paid. I'm a sponsorship coach for dang sake. Right? 100%. But if it, yeah, but if it means like you actually get the, you know, shake those kind of jitters out and like understand what it's going to be like so that I'm when you do get their dream. Right. Yeah. I'm fine with practice being zero dollars. Yeah. Yeah. I'm fine with you because yeah. you might need to do that because you might not feel ethical doing something else when you're experimenting. Like when you're experimenting, right. you may not feel ethical taking money. And mm -hmm. I'm okay with that. I'm not going to shame you for that or feel you're taking, right. you're tearing down the industry. You're getting us underpriced. And like, I'm okay with people who are realize I'm a student of this. I don't feel comfortable or ethical taking money right now for what I'm doing because I still feel like I'm learning the ropes and I don't know that I can create any value that I can justify being paid for. I'm okay with that. If that is what helps you get over your imposter syndrome and break yeah. free, I okay. will not shame you. Like a lot of people shame the idea of working for free. I understand there's a reason to do it. I understand that sometimes one, it's the way that you can cut in front of the line because you're now zero risk and you want the opportunity and you will find a way to pay your bills and you might have that hustle and grit in you. And it's not your problem that other people don't. It's not that it's not your problem if other people can't do that. What other people can't afford to do is not your problem, to be very real with yeah. you. You got to do yeah. what's right for you. You've only got to square it with yourself and your family. And that's it. Right. You only yeah, got to square I it with got, yourself and your family. I got a free wine fridge recently, Roberto. I was stoked about it. Like, uh, you know, the, 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 but the point was, was that they weren't sending us this gigantic brief and talking points and like wanting to review the content before it goes live. No, it's like, here's a free wine fridge. Yeah, we'll include it in the in our one of our vlogs. Like, no big deal, right? So I I'm do believe- something like, like that in a couple of weeks, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So it's just desk. like, I, I think it was like 800 bucks or something. I was stoked, right? So I'm getting it's just like, like an $800 desk for my basement. Yeah. Like. There we so so you know again like I think it comes down to like it's a case by case basis but um yeah I completely agree like you know getting those repetitions is is a great thing yeah I lied we have us one more because we have a super chat okay. <laughs> so we have at least one more and I'll let you go and then I'll do like the last uh two or three questions myself here Good stuff, but man. uh but uh world according to Briggs thank you for the twenty dollars super chat. I get sponsor offers every day. Wow, good for you, man. Me too. A lot of them are spam. I have no idea what to charge because I never do them. I'm thinking it is time to start. So World According to Briggs, um, I, my, my advice would be a couple of things. One, you probably have friends you can reach out to to just get some idea of what they think and not just ask them what they charge. Here's what I do sometimes, Justin. Sometimes I'll ask my friend's opinion about, hey, what do you think I'm doing with my brand? Or what do you think about what, what do you think I should be charging? And then I'll tell you what I am. Or like, what do you, what do you think? And not what, what I, you know, not what are you doing, or it, but what do you think? And well, how do you think about it? Not necessarily always a hard number, but I want to know their perspective, their opinion. I want them to tell me what they think the value is sometimes. And that helps a little bit, but also we gave you a ton of advice on starting to try to figure out like what to charge and how to think about it. But the reality is, in my opinion, dude, think about how much money you won't regret like asking for. You can even just make a package and the other thing is like, okay, how much am I worth? You can make a package and then people say yes or no. <laughs> You can make a price rate. You can make a rate card and people say yes or no. But what do you think, Justin? We got you. Let's pick your brain. 
All right, I got a quick one for you. I love uh, acronyms. So I've created something called the do rule. And there's three main price drivers that you should think about when trying to figure out how to price your rates. Ooh, um, so like D in the do rule is deliverables. What are they asking you to do? Is it an integrated video? Is it a dedicated video? Is it, are there going to be social amplification on other platforms? You need to know these things. A lot of brands will come to you and say, oh, like we just want to do a couple posts and you know, it'll be a great partnership. No, like how many posts? What so is literally, what's what the do format? they want me to do? What do they literally? What do? do you want me to do? Yeah. The you and the do rule is the usage rights. What do they want to do with your content beyond you posting it on your on your page? Right? Are they going to repurpose it as paid advertising? Uh, are they just going to regram it on their Instagram? Whatever it is, you need to know that because you need to charge accordingly. And then the E in the do rule is exclusivity. Do they want you to be competitive? You know, lockout. Uh, you know, to other other brands that they deem you know would be uh, you know competitors to their brand. And so like, and for how long, right? And what the category is. And so those, if you just think about those three things, it simplifies it, you know, makes it a lot easier to really realize like, okay, maybe I need to be charging this brand a little bit more because they want to run ads with my face for the next 12 months. So yeah, that's a really easy thing to think about. Exactly. I would rather build like, and I have like, I have these things, I have this thing that I'm like commissioning possibly being built where all the line items of things like that include the do rule, but if, like two or three other things that could be in a brand deal contract. And the thing is they have these sliders and like something, for example, exclusivity becomes a checkbox and a slider. And then it's like, for how long? And the slider. Yep. And the thing is, it may not change like the dollar amount, or maybe you put in a dollar amount to the calculator. I'm talking to a developer about how we do this, mm -hmm. but it's like, I, cause I don't know if I want to put dollar amounts in for people, but it's like, it's one of those, I would like to almost assign like point values to it. And then you decide what's starting and then you can make those points increments of what you want. Cause I'd rather mm -hmm. create like some kind of scoring system, but I would like people yep. to think about what the parameters of a line item, like the things in the do rule are. And then think of these as like sliders and say, well, the more this, what thing goes in like column one of D the price goes up. Yep. The less it is, the price goes down. Oh, the more they ask me to do, the more the price increases and I can slide it. And is it one notch, two notches or three notches, right? Mm -hmm. So, and one notch is, and the notches might in some cases represent, okay, exclusivity for 30 days, exclusivity for 90 days, exclusivity for six months, usage rights for three months, usage rights for six months, usage rights for 12 months. And the price can yep. go up accordingly yep. or it's like mm -hmm. deliverables it's like it, 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 that might have a bigger slider but you see what i'm saying it's like i would yep. like for people to think of things like a sliding scale for these and those yep. and i would love for them to forget that they have views and sub counts and vanity yep. metrics and think about pricing for the contract and just use this slider and say here are the things in the contract and you may not even have considered these options and you can price according to sliding the scale of these options. Yep. Yeah. I, uh, so I do have something like that in my, in, I have a calculator in my course. Um, and oh, it's very, sweet. it has, uh, all of those flags, you know, and there's different. So basically the way mine works is that, uh, it's for every 30 day period. So for every 30 day chunk, if it's one, you know, 60 days, 90 days, 120, whatever. Um, again, there's, there's a scale and there's a factor, a weight associated with, uh, because you know, honestly, like for whitelisting, for example, that should be for, it's not just like, oh, 30 days and 12 months is the same price. No, like they should be paying you for every month that they're doing that. So you're hundred mm percent -hmm. right. Like that, that's very badly needed. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. By the way, guys, you can, uh, it's creatorwizard.com. Is that correct? Creatorwizard.com is the site uh, where you can find, find all this. And I think. The most important thing to mention, because I send you paid sponsorship opportunities every single week. It's free. So um, I think that's like the best way to kind of stay updated on everything I'm, I'm working on. Yep. Creatorwizard.com slash join. Link is in the description and the show notes if you want to check that out. Justin, thank you so much for being my guest and joining me. Uh, for the rest of y'all, I am going to answer the last uh, three or four questions here, but we're going to let Justin go, get back to his family and enjoy the rest of his weekend. But again, I want to thank you for coming on the podcast and being my impromptu guest because I know this oh, yeah, is something man. near and dear to your heart. Absolutely, man. I really appreciate it. It was great. All right. Thanks so much, Justin. Stay awesome. Peace. Bye. All right, everybody. You've got me, me, me. Uh, wait. Uh, there we go. Uh, so... Uh, while you have me here, uh, we've got a handful of questions. 
So I'll try and answer those. There we go. And so let's see. Question, I'm starting to receive more inquiries from brands wanting to send me free product, but not really paying me for the review. What can I do to start charging this to paid, changing this to paid reviews? So I think we actually kind of addressed this a little bit. What I would tell you is you can go to them and you can just say, hey, I love the products. Thank you so much for sending them to me. Um, uh, I would like to move forward into a paid relationship with you here are my rates and here's what I'm thinking. Here is my pitch for what I want to do working with you. Um, let's set up or let's set up a meeting. You can either pitch them directly and tell them what the, the deal is, or you can say, can we set up a meeting? You know, so that's something that you could definitely do. So that would be kind of my thought. The other thing is I would just go ahead and start putting together a media kit and a rate card. Uh, you could um, get our brand deal starter kit to start to help with that. And I think that those things would go a long way. Uh, the main thing is don't ask, don't get. So you definitely have to have the conversation and arrange to have that conversation. And I think that that would be massively helpful to you. Do brands prefer lifestyle or education channels? They prefer both. They prefer both. And I think that lifestyle and education might have the largest range of opportunities out of any um, out of any of it. Should you ever consider paying for ads? No. Ads are for selling things, not for growing audiences. Scott asks, how much value do brands see in live streaming? In my experience, a ton, a ton of value in live streaming. It's actually really lucrative. And you could look at, um, and you can, um, and you can look at that in terms of Twitch as a really good example. Twitch is a really good example. Live streams are extremely valuable. Mitch Jackson, hey, what's up? Uh, you missed uh, most of the show, buddy. We went into um, Q&A mode. My guest tonight was Justin Moore from Creator Wizard, and the topic was around sponsorship and brand deals. So uh, really sad that uh, you couldn't be here from the beginning, but glad to see you coming through. Live production tips and tools says question. What do you do when you see a product from a brand and you realize it's not as good as you expected and you're supposed to promote it? If there's no contract, there's no obligation. If they didn't pay you, there shouldn't be a contract. If they didn't pay you, contracts usually might not be enforceable, but Mitch Jackson could talk to you about that since he's a lawyer. But if there's no money, if there's no payment, if there's no payment, there's no obligation to promote for, uh, as far as I'm concerned. And so if, if there's no obligation to uh, promote because there's no contract and there's no payment, it's nothing to worry about. You could tell them that like, hey, this isn't very good. You could tell them that you're, you don't have a lot of good things to say about it. And they would tell you that, you know, that's fair. If you aren't happy with it, we probably would not rather you wouldn't make a video. So you have the option of saying, hey, I'm going to give you guys an opportunity to improve the product. Send me the next version. Maybe this was a bad product or a thing. And I don't want to have to make a, a video uh, with everything I just did. You also do have the option to make a video if you haven't signed a contract saying otherwise where you do dislike it. So you can be authentic there. If you think you should prevent people from buying it, you do have that option. If you're not saying anything untruthful. So uh, that's, you know, that's something you could consider. People have done that. Scott, thank you for the super sticker, $5. Appreciate you. AJ says, should brands consider dubbing their videos? If there's a market and a market that they sell in, then maybe. It, they have to decide on that from an ROI standpoint. Should we have production fees for product reviews? Uh, you could build that into the price. Get good. Millhouse says, how do you build the confidence to approach a brand that you really want to work with? Uh, slow and steady wins the race before you ask for anything. Approach them just um, reaching out and interacting with them in social media without asking for anything. Build a rapport and then that will probably make it easier. So Roberto, I recently started my channel. How do I get viewers to subscribe? They're viewing and returning without subbing. 
are they viewing more with an average retention and view duration of more than 40 to 50%? Because if they're not, you need to improve the content to make it worth subscribing to. You also need to, you also need to make sure that if you're not getting 40 to 50%, you're going to have to improve the quality and editing of the videos, the structure of the videos. You also probably want to be very, very, very consistent. Your retention is one minute and 30 seconds. I don't know how long your video is. That's why I said the percentage. That's why I said the percentage. And the thing is, if it's a one, if it's a one minute, if you're getting a retention of one minute and 30 seconds, one minute and 30 seconds is not enough attention and not enough depth to get somebody to subscribe. I, I, I can't subscribe to a channel that I watched for a minute and 30 seconds. You have to get much higher percentages of retention. And if it's super short videos and it's three minutes, it's very hard to get someone to subscribe and care. They'll watch a video and move on. And also you have to be consistent about what type of content it is. If you're making a bunch of different types of videos, that's not really like you can watch and you can dip. You can't, you don't have to subscribe then. Committing to something is what gets a commitment from viewers. AJ Bishop, can paid reviews be unbiased? If the reviewer is unbiased, if the reviewer is unbiased, like money is not necessarily a good enough motive to be biased. Everyone likes to think that. I think a lot of broke, like I hate to say it this way. I think that a lot of people who are broke assume that money it immediately corrupts you and that money immediately moves the needle on your actions because I think a lot of people are projecting that they might compromise for money so other people must also. And that's not necessarily true. And the more money you do make, the less likely you are to compromise anything you do over money because there's not enough new money or money compared to what you would already make to motivate you. It's the same reason we said that if you make a certain amount of money, a certain amount of brand deal may not be enough to motivate you to even take a deal because you can make that money promoting your own brand. So the thing is, I find it ironic a lot of times that these YouTubers that have 100,000 subscribers, a half a million subscribers, a million subscribers, 5 million, 10 million, everyone thinks they're biased whenever they do a sponsored video or a product review or something else. It's like, you realize that whatever they're paying for the brand deal is less than what's sitting in that person's bank account, which means it's probably not enough of a motive for them to compromise on whatever they're doing. Giving you less money than the money that you already have means that saying no would have been the easiest thing you could have done because you will still make more money and you will still have more money than this temporary thing represents in another 30 days. So saying no once you're established, if you're a new, like if you're a small content creator, small influencer or something like that, a free product makes you feel really good about the brand. And maybe you might give them a pass on a few things. Make uh, Getting paid for the first time for a brand deal might give you a pass on certain things. I think you're less likely to be biased the longer you've been doing this. And I think the most biased product review is the product review where you spent your own money. If I go out and I spend $2,000 on a camera instead of a company sending it to me, lending it to me, or even giving it to me, what do you think? Isn't it, isn't it more likely that I will try to rationalize to myself spending $2,000 and be biased about why I can justify spending $2,000, $2,500? Because at that point, I could be just trying to convince myself. So I'm more biased when I buy something than when I get it for free, because if nothing else, I am trying to convince myself that this was worth the money that I spent. Because if I'm past returning it or or whatever, I already have it or whatever, I'm trying to rationalize my, my own buying, buying decision, which is a normal human thing to do. I'm not as inclined if I, again, I could afford to buy something. If I can afford to buy something and then I'm gifted to it, I'm more likely to take it for granted because the stakes are, well, I got this free thing and it's too late for them to ask for it back. There, there are no consequences other than I might not get more free stuff. But if I was something I could already afford, that might not mean that much to me. So the, the thing is, I believe if you're an established creator or you have the disposable income to buy the product in the first place, you are more likely to rationalize your buying and more likely to be biased about what you spent your money on and what you like than if you got something for free. In the same way that you will respect things you buy 
instead of gifts that you get a lot more for most people. That's true. Not everybody, but if you, um, buy something with your own money and children learn this early on and you learn this as a young adult, if you buy something with your own money, you value it, cherish it and, uh, are more protective of it. But if you just get something for free, you don't treat it with the same respect as the thing that you spent your own hard earned money on most of the time. And that's just how it is. That's, that's how it is for most people. Not everybody, but for most people, that is true. So if you think of it from that perspective, I give a lot of creators, I'm like, yeah, I think that's their honest opinion, especially if I know they could buy it themselves. I think it's their honest opinion because you're more likely to defend your favorite or recent purchase than you are a gift. Like, especially a gift that's like, you know, it's a brand that they're, they're practically strangers a lot of the time. It's like there's not an emotional attachment or connection to that. Something you bought with your own money, you're more emotional about. You're less, you know, and you're trying to explain or rationalize it away to yourself or justify it to other people who like, it's like, I know that this is a lot of money for a lot of people, but here's why it's good for me or here's why it's worth the investment. It's like you're defending buying something at that point. So it's more likely. The other thing is, if, it, if they're paying you less money than represents what's sitting in your bank account, the money, the profit motive is not significant enough compared to just not doing extra work at that point. Because you could just make your own video about whatever and there's no extra work, there's no contracts, there's no revisions, there's no more extra editing, edit this thing out, edit that thing out. It's like, it's less work to say no. So the money has to be significant and it has to be more money than you already have before I believe you would compromise on, on that. And, but I'm also assuming that you're not spending crazy amount of money or it'd have to be more money than you'd make in a month. It'd have to be maybe in that category before you would compromise. Because again, at that point, the easier thing is just not to do extra work and not say yes to a sponsorship or say yes to a product. Cause it's like, well, I could buy this on my own if it was good or not. And I could do this without being paid for it, or I could buy it myself, or it's easier to not do extra month and just make a video I want to make, or I could promote myself or promote my merch or promote my product and make the money. Like, you know what I'm saying? So it's a long winded answer, but I believe most content creators to be unbiased, especially if they're established creators. If they're established creators, I consider them to be more unbiased. If it's your first product review, the problem is you might be really excited about it. And so the more emotional you are about something, that's where bias will creep in. I think the longer you do this, though, you become less emotional the longer you do this. So the thing is, the longer you do this, the less, the more emotional distance you have and objectivity. It's not to say you don't love it anymore, but you become less emotionally connected to aspects of it. And so that makes you less biased. When you do buy something out of your own money, you become infinitely more biased. You have more of an emotional reaction to defending what you spent money on because that's just how we are as humans. As humans, you defend it. It's like, that's my brand or that's my team. It's like defending your favorite sports team, right? Defending a purchase you made, it ends up being like, a, well, I'm a Knicks fan or I'm a Jets fan. Yeah, we lost. Yeah, we sucked this season, but it, like, but I'm a fan and I go to the game, you know, and I root for my team and, that, and I wear the jersey and that's how it is, you know? So we, we do that. We got brand loyalty if we spend our own money because then we're invested if we spend our own money. If we get it for free, there's not as much loyalty unless it's just that it's early in your career and you're excited because everyone loves their first – like you're very appreciative of your first three deals and the first three people. That I still remember the first companies that sent me product ever. It was Lexar and Western Digital and Seagate. And I still remember the early days, my first brand, my first sponsored product deals, like where they didn't send me money, but they didn't give me money. But what they did was they sent me hundreds of dollars of free product, hundreds of dollars. And it would have made a significant difference in my budget. I could have done it, but it's like, it's one of those, oh, that breaks the bank. And it's something I needed to help make my work better and to back up my stuff. So Western Digital, Seagate and Lexar Pro all sent me products and I will always be grateful because they were the first people to ever prove and take a chance on me and respect me and send me hundreds of dollars worth of their product when I asked for it. 
And I will never forget that. I will never forget that. And so it made a huge difference. Those first three product things made a huge difference. And I didn't have to be biased, but I was emotionally invested because these were my first time, you know? Um, but when I buy something out of pocket, I'm much more biased. I'm more biased when I pay for things, 100%. And Adrian's right. If not brand loyalty, you definitely are more apt to rationalize its utility. Yup. A hundred percent, a hundred percent correct. Much more likely to rationalize its utility. Um, so much so. Oh, well, I can do this. Even if you do that thing like a couple of times a year. I still rationalize my drones. I still rationalize my drones. <laughs> Because I bought them. I like I rationalize my drones. I, I barely use them. I barely use them because I don't travel as much because it's been two years since we could travel like for real, for real. So it's like it's been two years because like I still rationalize my drones. I still rationalize my drones. And it's sad because, again, it's been two years since I could travel and justify it. <laughs> but I still do. I still explain away that every time I like. Well, here's what I can do with them. It's like, but yeah, how often do you do that, Roberto? Drones are pretty cool, Adrian. Yes, you're correct. Adrian, uh, Tech Dad, yeah, drones are awesome. Drones are awesome. I'm still about that life, but that's why I have them because it's like I got options. I mean, when I go and I finally do take my vacation in Hawaii uh, later this year, I'm hoping to. If I take my vacation in Hawaii as intended, then I'll finally be able to justify the drones. <laughs> So, yeah, but that's it for tonight, all of you. Uh, I really appreciate you. Thank you for dropping in, Randall. Thank you for everybody who's uh, watching and supporting the podcast. We might have another episode tomorrow night. I'm going to try and um, edit a video. Make sure you're checking out our guest, Justin Moore, the creator wizard himself. Uh, link is in the description. Go ahead and join his newsletter. Also, check out all the cool stuff in the description and the the show notes make sure you're catching the replay on the audio if you have not reviewed the podcast in spotify apple podcast and anywhere you can review podcast please give us a five-star rating helps us with the algorithm gives a five-star rating on the podcast on the audio side make sure you're subscribed with notifications for the video side here on youtube we'll catch you on the next one stay awesome bye